So fantastic, Tony Vincent, thank you so very much for those of you watching and listening. Um, you know, we are fortunate enough this morning. We are on, uh, I guess it's Thursday at 11 in the morning, maybe morning, maybe afternoon. Uh, we're in Atlanta at GAETC 2017, and I'm sitting here with Tony Vincent. So Tony, thank you so very much for joining us. Uh, I appreciate your time. Uh, how are you enjoying the conference so far? Uh, so I'm not just saying it because I'm here, but right? the Georgia Ed Tech Conference is probably my favorite event of the year. Um, it comes at just the right time of year. Like um, for me, I used to be a fifth grade teacher and now for like the last dozen years I've been self-employed. So I go to conferences, work with schools, and, and oftentimes it's kind of my last thing of the year before you know schools and conferences don't do much in December Close with, shop with, for testing yeah <laughs> so uh, so it's kind of a nice end of the year and I just get revived and I have all these things I want to explore after I leave the conference fantastic my phone is lighting up over here maybe ESPN will uh, show up or not show up on that so uh, <laughs> We'll see. Uh, always my first rule when we're podcasting is turn your phones off. I'm always the last one to turn it off, and it's my phone uh -huh. that ends up making the noise. I can feel the vibration. Yeah, it's going. So we'll do not disturb. Maybe that'll make it go there you away. Go. So, uh, fantastic. So, um, golly, I don't even know where to start. So we've been doing this podcast since uh, I started in August. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm new. I'm totally an amateur podcaster amateur videographer I'm trying to learn how to use the Adobe That's how you suite. learn by doing absolutely like, yeah, right, right. Just dive right into it I, I took a big fail yesterday <laughs> I, I lost one of my interviews it didn't uh -huh. you know, we we're having internet uh, issues we were talking about earlier I didn't record didn't broadcast got home was looking for it it was, it was lost and so you probably I, won't do that again I, that was <laughs> so I posted to Twitter hey you know I'm an amateur I lost it I learned a valuable lesson, hashtag fail forward. So I will fail forward. Uh -huh. uh, we're recording this one locally as well as trying to YouTube it. We'll see if it shows up on YouTube uh, with any sound or not. That's what people see. Or right, here's. Okay. Oh, I'm yes. Where, so there's different cameras going on here. What do I, yeah, what we, I need to look we at? We got all kinds. It's almost we like have, we're high We have tech. one person watching. Is that. So, are you watching your own? And that's, that's me. You. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So this is the camera that we're oh, recording. There's, okay. From. There's even another one. That's what there I'll actually. That's the one I should What I'll cut up and what I'll post more. Or this way. This is if people are watching right now, okay. which no one's watching right now. Uh, so we'll see. Um, so yeah. There we go. Now we're more like sports announcers. <laughs> now, now we're almost professional. <laughs> almost like I know what I'm doing. Yeah. So, um, so I was just saying, you know, we just started the podcast, and, and we're, I don't know if you know anything about iTeach, we're a, a unit that's housed inside the College of Ed at Kennesaw State University right here in North Atlanta. We work directly with K-12 schools. So we have a team of about 50 instructional coaches yeah. embedded in schools every day, uh, helping teachers, helping students, helping administrators uh, with what we're calling personalized learning. Um, and so I've been interviewing a coach every week and kind of sharing out tips and tricks and, and, and how we're bringing personalized learning to um, a diverse audience. We work with, with fluent schools, poor schools, um, you know, ur urban schools, yeah. rural schools. We're doing it all. Um, and, and the first question I ask all of my coaches on the podcast is, is to describe their average day. So what uh -huh. what does an average day look like <laughs> for Tony Benson? Well, there's, there's kind of two two different days. One, if I'm traveling and presenting like here, okay. um, that's usually I'm, I'm up late and up early tweaking presentations and workshops because until the very end. Right. Um, that's Forever the, the perfectionist. Yeah. And you think, oh, I get to repeat some sessions I've done before. But it's right. like you, I test everything out, like, oh, that website disappeared. That button's in a different place. <laughs> right, right, right. I found something I like better. And, and so it's, it's always it's always tweaking. If, I, if I'm at home, which is where most of my time is spent, really, um, I have an office in my basement. And uh, I... I uh, spend a lot of my day in front of my, my computer with like three big screens. Uh, I ex exploring, creating. Um, I've gotten into teaching online workshops and that's been oh, pretty cool. fun. It, yeah. they're, they're asynchronous, so they're, they're not live, but I right. make these weekly videos. So I'll be in production mode when I'm doing one of those workshops and getting videos ready. Um, but I've really been spending a lot of my time making graphics. Um, and I can use those in slides in my presentations, but they work great on social media to right, right. teach kind of techie tidbits. Um, yeah, call them like bite-sized learning. They're very tasty. Right, bite-sized learning. Uh, <laughs> I like that. But yeah. now that I, I post the most on Instagram and Twitter, but now I have a library of over 300 of them built up, and I think they're really handy for teachers to be able to glance at and think, oh, I want to know more about that, and then they can 
course, read up and, and find out right. more. And what, what, what software do you use to create these? Uh, usually Keynote on my okay. Mac. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I know a lot of people out there are uh, Google oriented and Google drawings and Google slides could do the same thing. Yeah, too. yeah, yeah. Okay, fantastic. Well, let me tell you, I was I was digging around trying to cyber stalk you and learn <laughs> as much as I could um, about you yesterday. And first off, uh, you know, to go back to your always tweaking, I was super impressed that your website seemed to be very fresh, and very up to date, and very current. Uh, you know, I've managed websites in the past, and that's a difficult task, especially I think in the world of ed tech because it changes. Like you were saying, you go and relook, and there's a button in a different place, or there's a link that's not live anymore, yeah. or you know. So kudos to you. I'm sure that's a uh, you know countless number of hours you've got. Uh, invested in keeping your well, stuff up to date. Well, one of the reasons it, it looks fresh kind of goes back to a session I did yesterday here at the conference, um, and that's web widgets and embed code. So since I'm always posting on Twitter, I always have at least two two posts on Twitter. I post on Instagram a couple times a week. I have my website pull that in, right? And it puts it onto the front page. It puts it in the sidebar. So even if I haven't been to my website for a month, because I I only get a chance to put up a new blog post about once a month, right? But really every day my website is updated with that content that right, is right, being right. sucked in into it. Uh, fantastic. Very good. And I don't know if you know this, but in your uh, PBL section, which we're going to talk about because I was super impressed with what I saw in there, mm -hmm. you have a Twitter post on your driving questions from Heather Cox. I don't know if you know Heather uh -huh. Cox. She is an IT instructional coach. Uh -huh. uh, so as I was digging through the other day, I took a <laughs> screenshot and I was like, oh my God our own Heather you Cox. You have great instructional is, coaches uh, and I've even talked to people at this conference where they're like, oh, I'm thinking of leaving my current job and being an instructional coach for right. Kennesaw. And right. They, well, thank you very much. Good. And we do have uh, some openings right now. If you're in the south side, Henry County, we need you. Uh, yeah, fantastic. So, uh, you know, another thing that I really loved, your, on your website, you talk about a failure that you had uh, with one of your fifth grade classes uh, in your whole SpongeBob oh, yeah. story, and that um, you know, if you could go back and do it over again, that you would try to incorporate more of those things that your kids were into, right? So, yeah. um, number one, kudos for your transparency and for your honesty. I think that's lacking in education right now. I, I think we talk about it, and I think it's maybe becoming a little more uh, popular or easier to, to share our failures. But, uh, but kudos to you for sharing with this audience that you have a moment of, of regret or failure or whatever yeah. you want to call it where here's, here's you know, what I had and you know, I let my kids down and, and here's if I could do it over again, here's how I would do it over. Yeah. So, you know. I mean, every, every year of teaching there's something like that, but especially in the early years. And I'll run into my former students and, um, you know, and they'll say, oh, you're one of my favorite teachers. And, and I always seem to run into the first couple years of teaching. Or it's always when one I of the worst, too, right? Yeah. And like, I'm what? like, oh, that was so great. And like, <laughs> oh, man, you, you saw nothing. Right? Like, if you would have been a couple years later, you could have got such a better Mr. Vincent in your classroom. Right, right. <laughs> Kayla Cole, if you're watching this, I've got a, an old student of mine who uh -huh. I still keep in contact with uh, probably 20 years ago. Uh -huh. and. Um, Kayla Cole is my instance, yeah, and you're like my first or second year of teaching, and she's like, oh, boy, you did this and you did that, and, and I'm like, like, man. Oh, first year. Yeah, if you could have seen me 15 years later, yeah. wow, we would have had a good time in that class. But yeah, so um, so my, back to the, the, the mistake, what what are some things that, that you think we're missing out on in the classroom today? Are there things that are happening that kids or that society is involved with that, that schools and that teachers are saying no, that's maybe a missed opportunity? Yeah, well, you know, I get to really interact with teachers who are more innovative, maybe, because right. I go to a lot of ed tech conferences, and, and they're the ones I connect with on uh, Twitter and Instagram. Yeah. So I, I just see so many opportunities out there, but I fully realize that that's not happening in a lot of classrooms. Right, right. But just um, for me, the, the, the big change is has been really with kind of the basis of, of project-based learning, and that's switching it around and having a project come first, and then that's the reason why you learn all this stuff. Right, right. Instead of the reason learning the stuff, it's like, it's in the book, it's gonna be on the test, this is why you're learning. Instead, flip it around. You know, I think one of the, the examples I had in that article you read was, you know, a, a teacher is talking about, well, we need to learn commas and friendly letter writing. 
you know, and typically in the way I taught, really, <laughs> most, of, most of my teaching of fifth grade was, well, we need to learn this. Right. Instead, flip it around and say, well, what's something that we really want the mayor to change? Or what's something that we want our principal to change? You know, a congressman, pick out somebody right. and then write them a friendly letter. And the reason you're learning to put the commas and you're learning the formatting is so that that person takes you seriously right. because you want something done. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. And if you're looking for a, a real world example, the movie Summer School comes to mind. Do you remember Summer School? with Mark Harmon no, he was I a teacher oh my gosh and this is uh, mid 80s I guess so he he's a he's a miserable teacher he's not having a good time I can't remember if he volunteered for summer school or got nominated but you know he's just sit, really jumping through the hoops going through the motions and so one of the projects they got to do a writing project and he doesn't want to teach writing so he basically says we're gonna write a letter to a company you know, uh -huh. whatever. And they end up writing this letter as part of the lesson to a sunglass company. One of the kids' sunglasses broke or something, and they wrote a letter to the sunglass, and they got a whole shipment of sunglasses. And so, you know, everyone wrote a letter, and they all got this, they got, like, free passes to Six Flags and the spot. So you see them later. They're, uh -huh. they're at Six Flags. Everyone's got on these cool new shades, and they're all things that, um, that, they, that these kids wrote about. But instead of just some you know, boring, we're going to write a five paragraph paper and study commas and comma splices. You know, it was, yeah. hey, let's write a, an action letter. I love, how old is that, this movie? Oh, it's, it's, it's mid to late 80s. Uh huh. Maybe Summer, early I'm gonna, 90s. I'm it up. There's so, a good lesson Summer in school, there. Mark yeah. Harmon. Yeah, he writes uh -huh. this, you know, but, but I, yeah, that's what I thought of when I, when I, when I read that and it makes perfect sense. And, you know, I think we're all guilty of, of teaching and then, we're gonna do this project so you can show me what I taught you versus let's open up with an idea, something we wanna do that's real and meaningful. And then, and then oh, you just happen to know, need to know about commas in order right. to get this project done. Right, <laughs> yeah. right. So and that's not always possible, I mean, with, with different things you're, you gotta teach, but, but when it is, you can really tap into that or tapping into their passions. Right. Um, that story was about um, my, my fifth graders just were obsessed with SpongeBob my first year of teaching. Like, just they, they wouldn't let it go, and I just banned it. I said no more talking about SpongeBob because right. I couldn't, couldn't take it. Um, and if I would have just brought that in right. to math, history, science, so, social studies, spelling, anything, they would have gone bonkers. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I work with a lot of parents who who don't understand Minecraft. And they don't get it and their kids are crafting and, and a lot of questions I get is how do I get them off of it or how do I get them and I'm like you're you're going at this all wrong yeah you need to sit down and have them explain what they're doing have them teach you how to craft something on a table and how to build something and blow it up and and yeah. you know and those are you know once you start showing some that you care about what they're into I mean then it's just open mind. You've built so. a relationship. You're making connections with what they love. Absolutely. They, yeah. And, I, and I, I tell parents, everything you want to know about what's going on in school and in their lives, that's where those conversations fro fle fro fro flow freely, right? You don't yeah. even have to ask the questions, but just while you're crafting together, they'll tell you about what's happening in school and what's going on with their teachers and who did what and who said what. And yeah. All those doors are just, they open by themselves. And the same thing happens in the classroom. I think when we, as teachers, can can show that we care and that we're engaged in what they're interested in, all those those doorways and those pathways, and they just open. And all of a sudden, I think we see kids seeking out knowledge and seeking out information, you know, yeah. on their own. Right, it's brilliant, fantastic. So um, let's talk about project learning. Um, how do you, if you haven't, if you're watching this or listening to this, if you haven't checked out Learning in Hand, so let's let's give that a plug first. Learninginhand.com. Yep. That's Tony's website. He's got millions, probably is a shy number right there. So many resources, so many ideas. Um, yeah, a fun fact, I registered that domain name 15 years ago, wow. and before that it was part of my class website, so the really learning in hand is probably about 18 years old. Jeez, so that's 2000. <laughs> so if you go back in that blog, it's ridiculous. I mean, there's stuff about Palm Pilots and 
Second Life and, you know, just stuff that oh. we don't really uh, talk about anymore. Second Life. <laughs> Doug Harrington, if you're listening, I had, a, uh, I had a graduate school professor who was huge in Second Life, built Kennesaw Hall, which was, with, uh, we don't have pictures of Kennesaw, uh, built this giant building to mimic, like, the College of uh-huh. Ed, and we would have class you know, sitting in the dugout behind there in Second Life. <laughs> I remember I was on a, uh, had a student who played soccer for me that I taught in high school and was playing soccer at uh, Virginia Tech. So I was up, I'd go up every year, my wife and I and my boys would go watch them play soccer up at Virginia Tech in Blacksburg. Beautiful town, you ever been to Blacksburg? No. Oh my goodness, it's a fantastic little college community. Uh, if you get an opportunity, go stop by Virginia Tech. But, I was that guy, this is probably 2006, 2007, so I'm sitting down in the uh, the opening of the hotel, they're vacuuming all around me, I got my laptop, my headphones, my microphone, I mean just look like a total nerd in uh-huh. Second Life, people <laughs> probably thought I was gaming but I was, I was in my graduate level course yeah. participating in class in Second Life. Um, <laughs> Old times there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let let's talk about project based learning because I really, uh, you know, shift gears here. I really found found a lot of your content very informative, very useful, and very up to date. Um, I mentioned that before. How do you keep your stuff fresh? Being, I mean, you you're removed from the classroom for a few years. Um, how do you keep it so fresh and up to date? Because I was expecting to be, all, you know, if I'm going to be honest and transparent, I was expecting to read some stuff that maybe hit me a couple years ago. But uh-huh. your stuff is fresh and up to date, and it is really right now. Um, and you know, I, I would even lean to frontier thinking on these things, and totally applicable to teachers on the edge. How, how do you keep it fresh, being so far removed from the classroom, so many years out of the classroom? I know we yeah. do this, but it's hard to stay fresh and, and tied to the classroom, yeah. and your it, stuff is right on top well, of that's, it. That's, that's awesome to hear. I, I work with a lot of teachers um, at conferences, in, and then I also get to oftentimes go into classrooms and do model lessons there, and then just being immersed in social media and what teachers share on Twitter and YouTube and stuff that I, I just, I feel like I'm still right in there. Right. <laughs> um, so, and I decided to become a teacher for sure when I was in sixth grade and probably even before that. Right. So I feel like I was in teacher's college that whole time. So sure. it's just, you know, when you're a teacher, it's just, just like part of your being. Yes, sir. And, uh, and then truthfully, um, the, way, the way a lot of my updating works is, oh, I have a project-based learning workshop to do for this school. Well, then I go through all my materials and update it and then I update what's on the website. So right, right. every time I have a new workshop or presentation, my my web resources get a refresh too, because that's what I refer the people in my workshop to. Right, right, right. So it has the benefit of even if you're not part of the part of the workshop, part of the learning, you, it, it's still published online. Right, fantastic. Yeah, if you're watching out there, Tony's not just about Instagram. Um, he's got some really in-depth, really good stuff on, on project-based learning that really every teacher needs to be checking out. Um, so how does how does um, so we're big on on what we're defining as personalized learning here, and that tends to be a bit of a buzzword right now uh, in the education space. And I bet if we went around and talked to thirty different people, we'd, we'd probably get thirty different definitions of what personalized learning is. Yeah. But but how do you see project based learning really fitting into this this personalized model? That, that we're all kind of talking about and hitting around. Yeah, and, yeah. I think I think it's a big component of personalized learning because obviously a, in, a, in a project we want students to make it meaningful to them, put their own spin on it, and learn the things they need to learn while doing the project. And so it kind of seems like the ultimate personalization because right. they, they're, they're learning for a purpose. It's, it's so authentic. It also has the benefit of students are working on different things at different times, which means the teacher can pull in groups, can pull in students, and work with them on um, something related to the project or not. But it, 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 the logistically, it works also into a personalized model. Right. Fantastic. So, and for those of you, he mentioned it a minute ago. If you caught it, he mentioned Palm Pilots. So, Tony, Tony was really in the classroom, a pioneer in in 
infusing technology and bringing devices and getting kids connected. So you, I had I had a class website in 1999. In 99, a website. And Before what did I people see? were googling, you'd go to Yahooligans to find it. Yahoo again? Is that the web archive? You've got a you've got a link on there to that. What is the web archive that you somewhere on there to go find your old missing? Oh links. yeah, um, yeah. There's there's some something on archive.org. There. There's yeah, yeah, there. Yeah, 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 but yeah. Yahoo had a kids version called Yahoo again that was meant for kids. And you could go to the the elementary classrooms on there. There's only like five of us on there in 1999. That's crazy. <laughs> and what what did you use to build it back then? I mean, were you oh, I've, coding I've, or were you using like? Because I built my yeah, my I first think, one came in 2002, and I was a front page guy. Uh huh. Um, but what were you using? Uh, uh, page Mill, I think, page and then there was mill. like Claris Homepage, then eventually Dreamweaver. Yeah, yeah. I moved to Dreamweaver as well, and I know there was some. Was it City? Wasn't there some kind of city sites or city? Geo Cities. I never got to the. Cities. Yeah, yeah. They're gone now, but yeah. yeah there was, but it was hard to get a website up then. I mean, now like I could run, just simply from an app, I could make a website while we're talking. Right. But back then, it it was it, it wasn't so easy. Yeah, I'm gonna and, have to go and find when I registered my first domain name because I don't know. I don't know when it was. It was not that early because I was just using a school yeah. system provided. I wish I had. I mean, like, I want TonyVincent.com, but some other Tony Vincent has that. What? I And then I... Let it go. I, oh, yeah, he, he won't. <laughs> um, he wanted my Twitter. <laughs> so I, oh, I should wow. have exchanged. I said, you want Twitter? You, <laughs> yeah, interesting. You can have Tony Vincent on Twitter if I can have TonyVincent.com. Yeah. Uh, but but I, I wanted... And then I thought, well, I want TonyVincent.org and .net. And those were... Some, some guy in Britain owned those. And then eventually he just let them expire. So I got those. Right. <laughs> But I, I just forward them to the learninginhand.com. So right, that's just right. kind of the, the place that yeah, that's it. shows up in Google. Sometimes when you type Tony Vincent, it comes up before the other Tony Vincent site. Depends so, on the day. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, all right. So so I'm curious as to how, how has personalized learning changed since you went one-to-one with Palm Pilots? I mean, what, you know... Describe maybe the experience that fifth graders had in 2001 with Palm Pilots and how more um, rich the experience is in like 2018 oh, where kids rich, maybe... Rich is probably a good word for it. I mean, with, you know, with Palm Pilots, students had a way to digitally take notes so they wouldn't lose them. You know, fifth graders were always... You know, right, they, right. They'd work on this thing forever and then the paper was gone and you're like... <laughs> This was like two weeks yeah. worth of research, yeah. and now you've lost the paper, the notebook that it was on. Like, so, so when we had keyboards, they could they could type into. So that that was a big piece. But we didn't have internet on there, and that that makes a world of difference. Right. One of my favorite projects we did was the million dollar project, where students had a fictional million dollars to spend on something to help the community. And it was part of our math unit where students practice fractions, ratios, percents, graphing, yeah, yeah, yeah. and all that. So it took like a month of time to do. But, um, you know, we had a couple of computers in the back of the classroom back in the late 90s. Right, so they, right. But there weren't prices on there really for things. So I, the students, I kept writing phone passes and they go to the office. And, and call Home and Depot. Call, or... yeah, like they needed to know the price of buying an RV. So they right. had, and I said, well, you got it. Tell them up front you're not really interested in buying, but you're working on a fifth grade project. Yeah, And wow. one time, the, I, I taught in Omaha, Nebraska. One time they ended up talking to the mayor because he his business was also selling RVs or something. Oh, wow. How cool. So, and he was into real estate, so they'd have to, they, so they, they'd call, and it just took so long to research that stuff. Yeah, yeah. And, and now, um, I, I'd say the investigation phase of a project with, is, is so much easier right, with right. Google and being able to email and contact instead of all these, these phone passes, right. which just took up so, so yeah. much time. So that's definitely made it richer. And then and then how students can express and share has changed immensely too. Back in 2001 on the Palm Pilots, we had an app called Sketchy, where students could make frame-by-frame -frame animations. So they wow. often either made an advertisement for what they've done yeah. or showed their learning in an animated GIF type thing. Sure. That took forever. Yeah. I mean, yeah. now there's apps like Explain Everything where they can just move things on the screen or they can um, put it into Google Slides and screencast it. They can make movies in so many different ways or right. Adobe Spark Video is an app and website where they can put in their their, their charts and graphs and uh, record a narration over them. So that the kinds of multimedia products that they make to show and share their learning is incredible. Right. And then the, the outlets for sharing. 
is, is just so much bigger because it used to be, well, you're going to share this with the rest of the class. Right. Or we're going to invite all the fifth grade, the other two fifth grade classrooms, yeah, and I'll yeah. buy popcorn and we'll share our projects yeah, that yeah. way. Or we'll have a parent night and parents come in. Well, now we can really leave the four walls of our classrooms and put it on social media, get it on our class website, which eventually my, my class website called Planet Fifth was a hub for our projects. Right. It was a place where we were able to share. And then today, you know, if, if, uh, if you're on Twitter and you want to have people see your student projects, the hashtag comments number four kids is awesome. There, there's always, there's always projects to see there. And then yeah. also um, people like me will, will search, I'll click and I'll say, okay, I'm going to make a goal of leaving a comment. And, and that's one of the coolest things for kids is to see that their audience is really there and their right. audience is giving them feedback. Right. Because in the end, their projects really, it's their audience and purpose. That, that really come into play and being able to to hear from your audience is pretty powerful. Right. I think uh, I think to add authenticity to projects, I think kids kids can sense that they feel it. Right? It, it turns out like another year of of work and of, of commitment that students put into what we're asking them to do in the classroom mm -hmm. when they're when it has that authentic piece of it, that real world feedback and that ability that, you know, someone outside of the other fifth grade class might actually see my work yeah. and comment on it. Yeah, and it turns out they don't really care about the grade, it's that they care about the project and the learning and, and, and right. the, their audience and purpose is what matters more than, what's Mr. Vincent going to grade this? Because truthfully, um, pretty much every one of my my students got an A on their project because if it wasn't A the first time, we would rework it and right. make it better. Right. The only time was if they just really goofed around and didn't use their time wisely that had to factor somehow into their project, right, but really right, right. the end product was always an A. Sure, sure. Mastery driven from way back then. <laughs> love it. I love it. Well, fantastic. Tony, I don't want to steal too much of your time. Um, we've been 30 minutes. I think uh, I really, really appreciate you coming by. Uh, for those of you out here, he is uh, at Tony Vincent on Twitter, uh, at Learning in Hand on Twitter, and he's got learninginhand.com. Go to his website, check out his resources. Uh, he's available for you to reach out, have him come to your school, have him come to your district. Um, That's how I make he, a living. He really is <laughs> a, a fantastic resource um, for teachers in the classroom and, and fresh and up to date. Um, and, and great ideas. So, anything you want to say? Any parting words before we get out of here? Um, I feel like I should have something insightful here, but uh, <laughs> I will just say, uh, just make it a great day. There you go. Thank you, Tony, very much. Thank you guys for watching. Join us later. We'll have more. Um, I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you so very much, Tony.